You are listening to Real Men Feel with Andy Grant. Real Men Feel encourages men to allow and express all of their emotions. Despite what you may have been taught, all emotions do serve you. Real Men Feel is committed to engaging in discussions that most men aren't having, but all men can benefit from. All links mentioned in each episode are in the show notes found on the blog at realmenfeel.org. Now, let's get to it. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Real Men Feel. I'm very glad you're joining us today. This is your host, Andy Grant. You know, every man is a leader in some aspect of their life, be it in the military, in their career, with their family, with their friends, if you're, you know, the captain of the softball team, whatever it is. If you engage with other human beings, you will at some point, either happily or begrudgingly, be called into a leadership role. And that's why today I'm excited to have a guest to talk about leadership and specifically leadership breakdowns and how to get beyond them. So I'm glad to welcome Mr. Eric Kaufman today. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thank you. I'm delighted to be on your show. Cool. And Eric is, is and his executive is wah. Eric is an executive coach, a consultant, author, and speaker. Your new book is Leadership Breakdown: The Symptoms, Solutions, and Resources to Lead Beyond the Breakdown. And instead of being kind of an academic book, uh, uh, something that you study in school, this is really based on your 20 years of conversations with actual executives in the field. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I'm a a big fan of academia and study and research, but um, I'm an even bigger fan of the real-time, real-world experience and how do we make stuff happen. Uh, Not how it could happen, but how it really does happen. Okay, so is is that why leadership is important to, to get stuff done? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, um, my, my simplest definition of leadership is a leader is somebody who organizes and influences people to achieve meaningful results, mm-hmm. right? So organize means you get people to work together in a, in a structured process way. Influence meaning that you're getting them to move in a certain direction, right? That's the whole idea. It's not just, it's, it's not just random, it's in a direction. To achieve meaningful results, right? Mm-hmm. Stuff that's meaningful to whom? To the individuals, to the organization, to the planet, to the cosmos, I mean, whatever level you want to go. But um, yeah, it's to get shit done. Yeah. Cool. And what first got you interested in, in leadership? Were you, did you find yourself in leadership roles or you just as a, as a course of study? What, what did that for you? Um, I think that my, my earliest sort of immersion into leadership was as actually as a scuba diving instructor. So I was, uh, I was uh, in college, I was, I was into scuba diving. I got really involved. I sort of kept moving up the ranks and certifications and, and, and decided I wanted to be an instructor. As an instructor, it was this really interesting uh, lesson because I was really good at diving, whatever that means, right? I could good neutral buoyancy, good use of oxygen. I could work all my equipment. But when I had to then teach it to other people, it was a fascinating uh, sort of two components of it fascinated me. One, that to teach something, I had to break it down. Right, so I don't know if you got certified in scuba diving or just learned how to bowl or anything, right? When you learn, it's like step one, step two, step three. When you're really proficient, you don't think about that anymore, it's intuitive. So there was something exciting to me about this role of teacher and then taking people into an adventure where there's risk, danger, but also real treasure and pleasure as a, you know, literally in a, in a foreign domain underwater. Um, it just turned me on so intensely to this idea that I could guide and lead people to have an experience. And the result in this case wasn't necessarily a new market, you know, a new product, but but the result was this kind of sense of excitement and awakening. And so that was my earliest uh, introduction to to the pleasure of kind of this this teaching leading type of approach that I take. Yeah, that's cool because I I, I do love that that merger. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who are in leadership roles because they're they're teaching and they're getting people to get things done that that wouldn't see themselves as, as quote unquote leaders like that that is some other role. Yeah, I mean the, the point you made earlier I think is so germane, right? We're all this this notion of leadership. If you're organizing and influencing, you're leading. My wife is organizing and influencing. My friends are organizing and influencing. You know, this this. Uh, the word leader actually comes from Anglo-Saxon, Old English, lithan. It means to go, to travel. So literally, if, you're, if you are initiating something where we're going to go somewhere and do something that is what I call inorganic, in other words, do something that wouldn't just happen because the clock turned and stuff happened, 
you're initiating something, that's leadership, right? And so, yes, there's a CEO and yes, there's the president, but man, the absence of leadership, the absence of will of, of people, of men, particularly willing to take on the role of leader is causing all kinds of hassle because they're waiting around as followers. Because so tell me, somebody tell me what to do. Hmm. And once you pass the age of 14 or 15, certainly once you pass the age of 18, there ought to be a component that says, I believe in something. I'm moving in some direction. I want to do something and I want other people to do it with. That really uh, raises an interesting point. Um, you know, I certainly never in elementary school or high school had a leadership class. You know, right. it, it can show up once I'm in mean, college based, but even then there's not as, I never had a specific leadership class, but it would show up elements. But you know, when I was growing up, when I was a teenager, you know, I thought all business was boring and leaders just, you were stuck in an office and it was lifeless. And, you know, how do I motivate people to sell more widgets? And, you know, I, I just thought that must be like a horrible existence. But um, luckily I've grown up and I've met, <laughs> met people, met high level executives who actually, you know, they're, they're interested in more things. Like in the beginning, you opened up talking about uh, whether you're influenced in sales or inspiration or the globe and that good leadership can go beyond the executive suite. Yeah. So the, um, the notion that business is boring and, and, um, it absolutely is for some people. <laughs> um, and uh, the reality, the deeper reality is that business is actually an act of creation. Think about it. You're an entrepreneur. You wanna make something. I have a new idea, a service or a product, right? I'm gonna to have to invent this, whatever invent means, right? It can be a process, it can be a project, it can be a, an, an actual item. I'm gonna to have to conceive it. I'm gonna to have to convince people to, to, to see the value of it. I'm gonna to have to find a way to make it happen, sell it, make it a valuable thing. That's creation. I mean, that is the act of creation. And so I think that what leadership offers is, an, is, a, is a place for creative expression in service to something, right? And if you're not the CEO or you're not the, the VP of whatever, you're still in service to something, creating. And I think that to me, this is the fundamentals of reality, of the, like my, my essential understanding of life is that you know you are a creator and the raw material is love mm. and if you can click into this idea that you are a creator and the raw material is love then leadership is just a channel through which you are communicating this capacity to both create which is make shit happen and love which is do it in a way that maintains interconnectedness rather than breaks things apart i love that message that <laughs> we're dealing in the raw material of love and wow, if business was ever presented to me in that way, I, I would have happily uh, gone into business and been in corporations. And It's not too late, my friend. Business yeah. is not being presented to you that way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I, uh, so for 13 years, I worked for Cisco Systems. Mm. And John Chambers was the executive at that time. And mm -hmm. he was phenomenal at making every single employee feel like they mattered, like mm -hmm. they were loved and that they were in service of something better and, and allowing creative expression. And you know, he was the first person I ever saw like that. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that while uh, he may be unique, he, he's not the only one out there. He's not the only one out there. And my, my, my work and my premise is around this subject called conscious leadership. So I'm particularly interested in the structure of conscious leadership. So how does, how does a CEO like you described actually tap into this idea and this practice of leading for results. So I talk about an unrelenting commitment to results with an unyielding regard for spirit. Mm -hmm. That's really where I think the world switches on, right? Let's get things done. That's results. But you know, let's get things. If you're a church, you still need to get things done. If you're a PTA, you need to get things done. You know what I mean? If you're a Boy Scout troop, you have to get things done. So getting things done is not anathema. It's not unique to the business world. It is life. So an unrelenting commitment to results with an unyielding regard for spirit. Can we actually, as leaders, lock into that sense of connectedness so that we are enlivening individuals, communities, and the planet? And my book, Leadership Breakdown, sort of emerges out of this place where I'm recognizing that a lot of people don't get it. Mm. And the breakdowns, whether that's breakdown because you as an individual are starting to burn out, or the breakdown is because the team isn't producing 
uh, creative product anymore or whether the company has gone flat or whether the breakdown is communication or tension in the, in, the, in, the, in the organization. The leader has everything to do with every one of those breakdowns. So how do we get in there and stop that vicious cycle? That's, hmm. that's what the book's about. And so are all those breakdowns and every possible other one, is it, is it kind of rooted in a lack of conscious leadership? Is it because spirit's been lost? Is it because commitment has been lost? You know, that's my premise. You know, I mean, there, there are strategic issues, there are financial issues, you know, legal issues, regulatory issues. At the heart of it, though, I think it's, you know, I, I say the biggest hurdle for every executive <clears throat> is lack of ego awareness and ego management, right? What happens is we get absorbed, you know, or, or a leader gets sucked into their ego. And, and, and look, man, the ego is not something we're ever going to get rid of. It is a standard feature. It is the basic DOS for all our software or iOS or whatever, right? Um, so I'm, I have no issue about trying to destroy the limited. I have a conversation, a whole book, a whole practice around how do we put it in proportion? And yes, the breakdowns are lack of ego awareness and lack of ego self management At least, yeah. Hmm. Is that more likely to happen if it's the, the sort of CEO that, that doesn't take advice well from his, his peers or perhaps he sees he has no peers so, <laughs> so no one can kind of keep you in check? It's one of, it's one of the symptoms of that, right? One of the symptoms is that... Uh, you don't want to get input, specifically negative input, you know, and it's not just CEO. I mean, we've got to talk about, you know, this is the CEO, this is the VPs, this is the directors, this is the managers, the supervisors. It's, this is not relegated to the CEO because there's only one CEO in every organization, but there are tens, hundreds, thousands of other participants, many of whom have a leadership role. So the ego, <laughs> it's not like you get an ego when you get a promotion. Right. You know, it's in there as a fixed thing. So Andy, anytime that anyone is stuck in their own um, sort of egoic, self-centered, self-focused, unaware, habitual pattern of being, that's a recipe for breakdown. Great. So in your consultancy, you work with the top executives, but if I'm getting this right, like what, what you share with them, what, what helps them can help any person in any management chain in any sort of leadership role. Yeah, I, I, I was talking with my wife about this a couple of years ago, and we were talking about uh, different characters that I'm working with, and these, these remarkably um, sort of accomplished and, and intelligent folks. I mean, I, I love these folks, but I was saying to her something like, you know, I advertise for executives and human beings show up. <laughs> I'm like, how did that happen? Uh, because I don't have any options. You know, I'm not a dog trainer. So... Um, so these are human characteristics. These are human, um, both strengths and foibles, right? And so if we can figure this out at the CEO level, you know, if you're the CEO of the company, Andy, you weren't born that way. You came into that. So at some point you have to learn this and learn it sooner rather than later. I have, I have daughters, I'm one of four, I have, I have three brothers. So I'm one of four boys, but I, I have two daughters. <clears throat> and I look at the, um, I've been, you know, for the many years, kind of seeing a lot of boys around my house. Um, I don't think we're doing a good enough job training them um, to be leaders in their own lives. Mm. And so when we see a lack of leadership in the corporate space or the workplace, um, it's starting young, you know, to your, to your point earlier, right? How do we get these folks to understand service, to understand discipline, to understand integrity, to understand compassion, to understand boldness, you know, those are leadership qualities that we can teach, not just as a CEO level, way earlier than that. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I, again, I never put this together that the qualities that make a good, strong, healthy leader are the qualities that make a good, strong, healthy human being, as, as, as you're discovering when you call for executives and humans show up. And, you know, it's, uh, boy, it almost, it, it's not, it doesn't show up as common sense. It's, it's, it's kind of common wisdom that we wish we saw in everybody. It is, you know, and it's, it's because we've kind of um, relegated these different compartments of life as though they're separated, but they're not. You know, you're a human being, you're doing a thing, whether that's playing a guitar and being a musician, whether it's being a, you know, a programmer, you know, designing software, or whether that's being somebody who's organizing and influencing people as a 
functional role of leadership in the business. Um, you know, in, in, in particular, what I'm interested in and what I write about and what I'm very keen on promoting is what I think is part of the sort of the marker of a conscious leader is that they have these three qualities, right? That, that, and when you hear this again, it's not just going to be about leadership, right? But I'm interested in somebody who's got, um, who is bold, curious, and kind. Now think of a man who's bold, curious, and kind. Bold, you're going after what's important to you, right? Because it takes some boldness to pursue uh, what's meaningful to you and important to you because it turns out, not that the world is going to resist you, but if you don't take action in your own uh, sort of advocacy, then it's probably not going to happen for you. So there's a certain boldness required to just be able to switch on and have a meaningful experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, curious. Because for the love of God, if you stop being curious, life is boring and you become quite um, predictable and you develop this condition that I call psychosclerosis, a hardening of the mind. <laughs> <laughs> you can't find that in medical books, but you can find it on the, on, on the podcast, you know. Psychosclerosis is lack of curiosity and then kind. Because often we think that if you're going to be bold and you're going to be a driver and you're going to be curious, which means you're going to come, you know, be creative and, and have ideas then you don't have to be kind. But if you're not kind, you're an asshole, right? And being a bold, curious asshole is not anything that I want to add to the mix. We've got plenty of those. Yeah. Kind is basically the capacity to see other people as worthy human beings and to treat them in a way that honors the spirit and the, and the uniqueness of them. And so now I want that in CEOs. I want that in VPs. I also want that in my neighbor. I want that in my daughter. I want that in me. And so you know, this, this uh, bold, curious, kind kind of combo to me is where the, the conscious leader starts to really come online. Hmm. So our, our organization is coming to you <laughs> asking to help grow their consciousness, or is this something, it, it's more you're, you're pushing this idea uphill? Um, there's, um, there is more of an appetite. When I did this 20 years ago, I started 20 years ago, my first presentation to an audience, a large audience, was called Spirituality in the Workplace. And I wanted to really introduce these, these constructs of how do we bring spirit into the workplace. And literally, it was an hour-long keynote. It was fantastic. People loved it. Nobody hired me. <laughs> Eric, this is brilliant. It's wonderful. See you later. You know, 20 years later, we're in a really different vibe right now. Um, I'll give you an example. Larry Fink is the CEO of BlackRock Investments. Um, they hold, I believe, $1.7 trillion in investments. That's trillion with a T. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how to visualize that amount of money. Every year he writes a letter to the CEOs, the, the people he, he invests money for. And 2018, 19, and now January 2020, his letter's basically been the same thing. From now on, organizations we invest in have to be organizations that have purpose as well as profit in their bottom line from now on they have to look out for society and for humans not just for their shareholders oh my god 20 years ago that was unheard of yeah. but now it's coming from on high literally from the biggest investment firm in the world so there is an appetite for it not only because it's kind of um uh, socially acceptable but because we've arrived at a serious juncture in the history of humanity that has changed the game yeah, and so, um, in essence, uh, we've literally arrived at a time where measuring a time where social design has moved for the first time in, a, in an actual measurable way, has moved from what used to be religion, then government, to business. Business leaders are the designers of social experience and human society. And so now we have business leaders who are wearing this mantle of responsibility for which they're unprepared and still many of them unaware. <laughs> and that's why it's required, right? Because now it's become business leaders who are the de facto shapers of society, right? Google, Apple, Microsoft, Nike, Gatorade, you name it. They're having more of an impact on society now than the government and, and, and many religions. And so, wow, what do we do about that? And it's amazing that, and I don't disagree with that at all, but it, it, what the amazing part to me is that how many people in business aren't, don't recognize that, aren't aware of the influence they're having. 
they're not, which is why I'm sort of, you know, writing this book, getting on the podcast. I need, you know, we need to sort of do a concerted effort to awaken human beings, leaders, folks in organization to the reality that the stake of humanity, and I'm, I'm not trying to be hyperbolic, it's just it's measurably so. The stake of humanity has moved into the hands of leaders of organizations. And if we don't get them switched on to being conscious leaders and they continue to behave in the way that has these breakdowns, the cost is no longer just bottom line to the organization. The cost is social, humanitarian, and planetary, right? Environmental. Mm -hmm. And so this is why this has gone past the, you know, I was kind of shy about it years ago going, ah, I don't know if I should stake my claim on this or kind of get out publicly. And I'm like, man, we got to, you know, we have to, because the speed at which technology is evolving, the impact on, on humanity and society, the size of the population on the planet and the capacity for change has made it such that we don't have the luxury of kind of theorizing about it now. Mm -hmm. We have to get business leaders switched on and tuned in and being conscious. Hmm. You know, and tell me if you see this as well, but I do see lots of individuals and organizations that kind of call themselves spiritual, that, that see corporations and, and business as kind of the enemy. And they, they, almost, they want to do battle with them uh, as opposed to kind of bring it together and, and realizing that, well, those are humans and they can grow and learn like, like you have. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the people who want to fight for peace. I mean, I just love that, uh, I, 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 you know, that kind of oxymoron. We're going to fight for peace. And then there's uh, literally I was in the store last night. I took a picture on my phone. <laughs> there's a whole section I called plant based meat. You know, it's. <laughs> It's in that category of things that just don't go together, right? Plant-based meat, fighting for peace. Um, I think that, um, you know, I don't know what you're like, but I'm going to guess if it's anything similar to what I do. When someone attacks me, I'm not feeling particularly inclined to want to have a meaningful conversation with them. Mm. Um, I'm really inclined to defend myself at one and then, if necessary, attack back, right? That's probably not that remarkably unusual. Right. So the question isn't how do we fight these folks? The question is how do we convert them? Right? Conversion is the issue, not, not battle. Because we're not going to eliminate the impulse and the structure of business on the planet, but we can convert the leaders into being more conscious. There's a great example. Ed um, Bastine is the CEO of um, Delta Airlines. And um, a couple of years ago, remember that horrible um, shooting in Parkland at the Parkland High School oh, in, sure. in, uh, in Florida? And so after that, um, Delta Airlines said, you know what, we are going to discontinue the um, credits that we're going to give the NRA members on Delta because we, we want to distance ourselves from NRA because we don't think the NRA is being responsible in terms of how they're, how they're uh, advocating gun use. The lieutenant governor of, uh, of Georgia went to Delta and said, hey, Delta, your, head, your hub is in here in, in Atlanta. If you don't reverse your decision, we'll pull your tax credits and it's going to cost you billions of dollars. Right. So uh, the, the CEO of Bestain, the CEO of uh, Delta, turns to the lieutenant governor and says, look, we're doing this because we think this is the right thing to do. Our values are not for sale. That's a guy who's kind of waking up yeah. to the power and responsibility they has. Regardless of whether you agree or disagree about the gun and the NRA, the fact that he recognized that he actually has a social responsibility, his values are not for sale, is a fascinating comment. Mm -hmm. You would not have heard that 20 years ago. Right, right, no. And you know, so, so doing battle, I think, you know, and calling them not spiritual is just, you know, I mean, what's the highest form of spiritual expression? It's love. What does Jesus do when he walks around with all the people, the lepers, the prostitutes, the, the beggars? He loves them. And what's love if it's not acceptance and bonding? And so if you really want to affect somebody, you got to connect with them, not pull apart. And so there has to be love. Now you can still be firm and tough and you can be pushy and you can be demanding. I'm that way with my kids. My kids are that way with me. My wife and I go back. Well, we love each other and there's still intensity. So we, there's not lack of intensity when there's love. But, you know, fighting just creates distance. Your own spirituality, were you raised in a specific religion, spirituality? Was this, were these things that you kind of discovered on your own journey? Um, so I, I was born and I grew up in Israel. So I was raised, uh, my grandparents are uh, Jewish survivors of the Holocaust of Nazi Germany. My 
father was born in 1939 uh, Israel and I was born there um, and grew up um, Jewish in Israel. I um, came to America to go to college when I was 18 years old and um, and um, like any good 18 year old away from his family and away from his country and away from his culture, I found drugs and girls and rock and roll and <laughs> was promptly kicked out of college a year later. Um, the issue was I was 19, I was kicked out of college and I was on a student visa. So it was like, oh my God, I think I should do something differently than what I'm doing. Um, and so I, so the short version is I looked around for how do I get control of my life and, uh, and was introduced to Zen uh, meditation. And so I began meditating in the Zen tradition when I was 19. I'm now 53, so it's a long time. Um, I ended up living in an actual community for 14 years, uh, studying really intensely um, in the Zen practice. And so it's been a 30 plus year uh, journey in uh, bringing those two worlds together, right? The world of yeah. business and commerce and the world of leadership and, and these deep practices. Uh, I'm, I'm far more influenced by sort of the, the Zen approaches at a practical level than anything else. And then, yeah, how, how did that bridge of going from being in this Zen community, uh, just, you know, I can only speak of stereotypes, you know, just sitting around and crossed, crossed legs all the time and, and wanting peace in the world. Like, how does, how does that person end up uh, serving corporate America? Yeah, fair question. So I, I, I was living in the community and I graduated high school, uh, I graduated college, I went to work at 3M, I went to work at Corning. So I was working in corporate while living in this community. Okay. So it was a, it was a very um, interesting bifurcated experience, right? <laughs> Morning, robe, meditation, breakfast, suit, go to work, afternoon, out of suit, back into robe. Um, then after 11 years of that, I decided, okay, I'm done. This is too, it's crazy making, yeah? I'm going to quit one or the other. And I decided to quit uh, my job in corporate. So I quit, gave away all my money, liquidated my 401k, took oaths of, you know, sort of obedience and then and, and, and poverty. That's a bad idea. But anyway, um, <laughs> I went down to, you know, zero money, zero pro uh, uh, objects. And I actually took it a step further. I went to New Mexico. We had a property out there and I built a cabin in the woods and I went into a very long meditation retreat. Very long, meaning it ended up being a year-long silent retreat. Wow. In the mountains of New Mexico, up in the Cibola Forest, up above uh, the Tijeras Valley there. And, um, and uh, what happened at the end of the year is I had this revelation that said, hey, you're going the wrong way. And I thought, what? It said, yes, you will be better served with wife, children, and service to community than cross-legged on the mountains. And I thought, God, there's got to be another message. I'm going to hang around and see if anything else comes through. <laughs> and nothing came through. Um, so I left and moved to San Diego and, and started, you know, my practice of how to, how to combine kind of the spirit wisdom with the business uh, drive. I found a woman who was nuts enough to marry me. Uh, we'll be married 21 years uh, next month. And... Uh, my daughter's now 19 and 17. So, um, so it's been, yeah, so it's been 20 years of really combining those two things. And, you know, if you look at my practice 15 years ago, it's different than what it is today, right? I mean, I'm, I'm more established. The world is more prepared. I'm, um, I've, I've gone from sort of trying to convince people that I know what I'm doing to actually knowing what I'm doing, which was like, thank God, that's a nice switch. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, it's, it's very practical, right? I'm, I mean, I had a conversation this morning with a client very practical about bottom line p l but we're also talking very practically about what is this what's the energy signature that he's operating from as he's going into the room there's an energy signature you know you sit i sit we stand we walk there's a there's a there's a center of gravity of our energy and we can make a choice about what that energy signature is coming from and how it radiates and so you know alex and i were talking about here is you know you want to convince this guy you want to bring this person on board you know make sure you have this plan and where are you coming from energetically spiritually as a human being so it's a beautiful combination. There's no conflict. Yeah, I, I, I freaking love it. Um, hmm. And are people more receptive? Is it, is it easier to, to make your offerings and more people going, oh my God, this is what we need or, or not? There, there, I had a great experience. A couple months ago, I was at a conference. Uh, I was invited to present at a conference in Houston. And there was, uh, it was an international crowd listening from all around the world. 
And, um, and at one point they had, I don't know, there were a few thousand people at this conference and they did this thing they called a CEO deep dive. So people who were CEOs uh, could apply and were selected anyway. I ended up spending a day with 70 CEOs from, these, from all around the world in this industry. And I took him through an experience called enlightened, the Enlightened CEO. And these are people who had, were cold to this, right? They, they liked the idea, they signed up, but they don't necessarily have their own lifelong practice in this. What was cool about it is that they fully jumped in and they got a shit ton of value out of it. And for me, it was this beautiful experience that it wasn't just a choir that was interested. This is really transferable to anybody who's running a business and wants to go deeper. If you're the CEO, if you are the, 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 the head person, if you're the head person of your department, forget CEO, right? You're the head of your department. For you to get better results is not just a matter of another technique or a better strategy, it's a matter of mindset. Hmm. And this conscious leadership is the ultimate game of mindset, hmm. right? And so people want to find an edge. Turns out the edge is not outside of them. The edge is inside of them. And if we can come to the edge inside of them and they can cross that, go past that edge, the potential that's unleashed is quite remarkable and profoundly satisfying. And that's where the leadership breakdowns kind of stop. That's why I say stop the vicious cycle, stop the, 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 uh, the struggle by having this internal experience that then becomes externally manifest. You know, I think, I think this was an actual saying when I was growing up, you know, that good, good leaders are born, they're not made. Um, but you really saying, no, conscious leaders are, are made. Yeah, you know, good leaders are born is like, um, there is evidence that some of that is true. Just like you have Beethoven and Bach and Mozart that are kind of born geniuses who can just, you know, tickle the ivories and make music pop out. Um, but you can take somebody with two left hands like me and I can still learn the piano, right? They will have an immediate advantage because they have the talent, but talent doesn't become skill without training. There's a difference between talent and skill. There's a lot of talented people that don't become skillful. I have a friend of mine who's got a talent. He can literally touch any musical instrument and figure it out. But he's never touched one long enough to become skillful at it. Hmm. Right? So he's got the talent, but not the skill. You can even develop the skill if you don't have the talent. So absolute leadership. Some people are born, but the vast majority, the overwhelming majority, have learned how to do it. You know, and, and, and I and my whole sort of cadre of colleagues who are in the leadership development, executive development work, that's what we do all day long. We help people become better leaders who make better decisions, achieve better results, and make better connections with humans. And is, is the wider leadership um, workplace, the, the market of, of leadership skills and development, is this consciousness, is this idea of love and spirituality, is that in the entire industry or is it still a, a niche set? It's not the entire industry, but it's, 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 um, you're seeing it everywhere. Harvard's teaching courses of mindful leadership. Yale, Stanford, Columbia, Brown. I mean, every one of them has got these ideas of, you know, green leadership, mindful leadership. You're beginning to see, you know, at the highest level of what it, what it means to be conscious. It means to be one with everything, right, at a mystical level. What does that one with everything means? It means that we are in, we see the interconnectedness of all things. And so to raise your consciousness means that you are, you are slowly reducing your attachment to the individual separate ego and more and more seeing the interconnectedness of all things. Now that happens to be a really good trick. If you're going to be a strategist, it happens to be a really good you know, skill. If you're going to be a team builder, it happens to be a really good skill. If you're going to be selling. So it enhances everything. And, and many of the tr sort of traditional venues are beginning to see it's inevitable. And so they're bringing it in. The degree to which and the, the, the intensity of which and the, the skill with which the instructors can teach it varies, right? I've been doing this, I've been, I've, I've, you know, I'm, I, three times a year I go to five day silent retreats. I've done 60 silent retreats over the years. I've done a year long silent retreat. I meditate every morning. What I primarily want to bring to people is not my genius, not my insight, but I want you, Andy, and I want every leader to be able to access that for themselves. Because once you access it, you can't deny it. Once you, we had, I did a three-day um, workshop called the Alchemical Executive. <laughs> um, it's really, it's really beautiful, and it's really kind of intense. 
And the alchemical executive, one of the executives left and called me a week later and she goes, what the hell did you do to me? <laughs> I said, uh, what are you talking about? She said, you know, I just bought a new car. It's electric. I'm no longer using straws. Why? We never talked about electric cars or straws at the, at the workshop. I don't care about that. That's not the heart of it. But what happens is once you start tapping into the interconnectedness of all of life, you start taking action because you honor the inevitable impact that you're having. Mm. That's a straw on an electric car. She's also treating her people more kindly. Yeah. She's also engaging more effectively with other departments. You know, so um, it's practical. Yeah. This is and not it, some kind of out there thing. Right. And it, and it sounds like once you experience the interconnectedness, you, 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 you gladly take more responsibility. Yes, because that's yeah. inevitable. That becomes the leadership impulse. What is, if, if I feel that I'm connected to everything, then the responsibility isn't a burden. It's simply a move of kindness and boldness and curiosity to lean into that connectedness, right? Mm. And think about that as your leader. Mm. Think about that as your priest. Think about that as your scout leader. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. By adding kindness and consciousness, does that eliminate common mistakes in leadership or does it change them or make them easier to deal with? Or does a conscious leader have just a whole different set of possible mistakes that they're making? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know how to eliminate mistakes. If I did, I'd stop making them in my own life and that ain't happening yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, I know for a fact though, that when a leader makes mistakes and they're coming from a place where they are being kind and we're being connected and they're being driven and bold and curious, the context with which they're received. So they're, they're going to make a mistake. People around them are less inclined to want to screw them for the mistake or, or crucify them for it. They're more likely to have people still on their side, helping them get back in the ditch and pull it in their car out of the ditch and back onto the road. So how to avoid mistakes? I don't know. Mistakes are because you did, you know, for the most part, you do your best and it, did, it wasn't right. So mistakes happen. But how other people choose to engage with you makes a big difference as to whether or not you're the kind of person they want to help. Right. And so it won't make them go away. It'll make it easier to, to fix. Right. Yeah. You, you see them sooner. You can accept them sooner. You're not yes. harshly judged for them. Yeah. So again, it, it Again, all, everything you're talking about bringing to the leader is really a cultural shift for an entire organization as well. It's, a, it's 100%. And, um, Thoreau said many years ago, the institution is a lengthened shadow of one man. It literally meant that, you know, if you're the leader, you're casting a shadow and that, and that mold shapes the organization. And so to the degree that you engage in a way that is thoughtful, curious, that's bold, but that's also kind, that's the cultural vibe and imprint that you're putting out and people will pick up on that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, it is far more engaging for people to want to work in that environment. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if, if, and when we're in a talent crunch, which we are now having the kind of environment where it is desirable to work is a flat out value to the organization. So, so then with that said, is it, will this change stick? Will a, will a conscious organization stay conscious even as the economy takes a turn down? That's a freaking great question. Right. I mean, is this just a luxury of riches, right? Hmm. Can you do it while things... Are, yeah. My, uh, I had a friend of mine used to say, life is... Life is... No. Uh, life is funny when all is sunny, but it ain't no joke when you're broke. <laughs> you know? Um, what, um, so we had to turn down 10 years ago, right? 2007, 2008, 2009, right? There was a pretty harsh times. The companies that thrived were the ones that were the one, the, the people felt most inclined to remain engaged mm. and engagement is sort of the name of the game, right? Cause it's not just whether or not you're showing up to work, but engage means that I'm committed. I'm putting my energy into it and I'm helping the organization move forward. And during the turn down, the companies that continue to thrive were the ones where people were engaged and they were engaged not because they were being paid well, not because they were, the economy was great, but they were engaged because of the experience that we're having with other humans in the business. 
The number one predictor of engagement, according to the Gallup poll of engagement, is a positive relationship with your direct boss. Mm. And that positive relationship, read all the research, has basically to do with, I feel like a worthwhile human being when I show up to work. Yeah. If you're a conscious leader, you're going to thrive when things are going well. You're going to thrive even more when things are going badly, when the economy around you is going badly, because you will be the island where people want to jump on and keep you know, supporting. Mm. Yeah, keep, keep enjoying their own humanity and community, even if the outside world is getting more chaotic. As it always does. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So, so what are some symptoms of, of leadership breakdown? To, to what, what, is, what are some signs that, that an organization or an individual um, needs to up their consciousness game? Yeah. Um, there are, one of the great symptoms is, um, as I have, organiz- I have leaders ask me this all the time, We need more accountability around here. Lack of accountability. Lack of accountability is a sign that um, people aren't engaged, aren't following through, and there's fear, right? So if you have disengagement, lack of follow through, and fear, those are absolute signs of breakdown, right? Um, If you have delay in terms of project turnaround and decision making, decision making, which is sort of the key game for executives, you're in a team, think about this, you're on a team, you're trying to make a decision, you've now had this meeting and you've had this conversation, this topic has been on the agenda for a month and you still haven't solved it. Why haven't you solved it? If it's a month or if it's two months, it's no longer a strategy or finance, it has to do with the dynamic exchange between people. So there's lack of consciousness and leadership breakdown, people are stuck in their egos, and so the decision's taking too long. So if you just think about lack of accountability and long decision cycles, you've got some of the core issues that are driving so many of the other organizational problems. We're too, too late to go to market, not enough customer satisfaction, lack of innovation in the organization. Those are all kind of emanating out of this no accountability and not good decision making. And why you would have lack of accountability and no good decision making is because you have egos stuck in battles rather than people working collaboratively and innovatively together. So those are some of the classic examples of it. Hmm. And in your experience so far, is there, is there a typical age of company or size that, that works best in, through, the, through the alchemical process? Um, in my experience, it has to do with the human beings. Uh, you can have a, 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 a giant company like Delta where the CEO decides to do something, and so it, 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 it rolls down that way. You can have a startup. Um, it's not the size or the age of the organization, it's the willingness of the leaders to step up and lead. Mm. Not just lead in terms of charging financially, but lead in terms of shaping the organization and the consequent impact it has on the people and the society around it. And so, um, yes, we could argue that it's a little bit easier for a private, closely held company to affect some of these than a publicly traded company that's governed by the whims of the market and the quarterly return cycle. Um, so maybe there's a distinction there, right? Private companies would have an easier job pulling this off. Okay. Uh, but public companies can do it just as well. It takes leadership. I mean, that's the whole point. It takes leadership, yeah. you know, and it's a leadership breakdown to not even try. Yeah. And are you, are you seeing that rise or fall are are there leaders that are just shutting down and, and kind of giving up or more people willing to change to survive and thrive we're seeing way more people willing to engage in this conversation about sort of conscious leadership right this broad topic of being more awake more responsible for the business impact beyond the bottom line right so there's this whole movement around the triple bottom line i, I, I don't know if you're familiar with that but the triple bottom line is this wonderful construct of conscious. Now there's conscious capitalism, there's conscious business, conscious leadership. The triple bottom line is profit, right? How does a company continue to thrive? People, what are you doing for society? And planet, what's happening environmentally? And so people, oh, profit, people, and planet is the triple bottom line has become quite popular and growing in popularity. And that's, that's a version of being more conscious, right? Not just my own ego and not just the shareholders, but the bigger picture, how do we fit into society and how do we impact the planet? And so there is more and more and more of that. Again, like I said earlier on, because it's good for business, yes, 
but also because we have passed the tipping point of where the um, of where the social and planetary leadership has come from. It, it's just it's moved away from the traditional church or traditional government, and it's now in business. Yeah. And so more and more people are embracing it, yeah. thankfully. And yeah. our job is to increase that awareness, make it more accessible and available, write books on it, teach classes on it, engage with people so that they understand how to do it. And again, that's why when you start it off, the academics of it's fascinating, but if you're a sitting executive, you need the nuts and bolts. Right. What do I do now? Ideally, it, you know, if, if you're doing something that helps the planet and helps people, well, it should help business. Like that, that should work. That should be something that people value. And it is increasingly so. I mean, you look at the millennials, you look at the sort of generation, even the millennials have in a way affected all of our purchasing uh, ideas and think of how much effort goes on to the Super Bowl ads, how many ads were no longer just selling through sex, but selling through kind of doing the right thing. You're being environmentally friendly, being purposeful, right? It used to be every ad would just sell because you can get laid more, you'll be happier in that way, right? Look at advertising is sort of the heartbeat of the market. And look at how many ads are speaking to whether it's beer or soap or drugs are now selling on the sense of purpose, a bigger, a bigger meaning. That tells you something, right? That's the mainstream if ever there was one. Advertisers don't want to waste their time with fringe ideas. They want to move product. Right. And when you see advertisers really pushing on purpose and environmentally friendly and, and, and socially responsible, you know we've reached a point where that's mainstream. Yeah, cool. So your your this is your second book, Leadership Breakdown, and is is it just released this month, February of twenty twenty? Um, yes, we're still shooting for February. Uh, oh, okay. So it's it's not it's not out yet. People cannot get this yet. No, but they can go to leadershipbreakdown dot com, okay. um, and there's a there's the ten top mistakes that lead to leadership breakdown. So to your question, you know, what are the symptoms? There's 10 of them in there. Um, and so that's a gift to them. If they give me their email, I'll let them know when the book comes out. But that, that would be the, the place to go, leadershipbreakdown.com. All right, great, great. And is there, a, do you have your own site or your consultant business? Oh, do yeah, you have sure, that sure, to yeah. reach out with you? Yeah, yeah my site is uh, sagatica.com, S-A-G-A-T-I-C-A, -A -A, sagatica.com. It's a term that's derived from the Latin word sagacitas, which is where we get sagacious or sage. Okay. So the idea of our consulting work is to, um, to uh, cultivate executive wisdom, right? How can you be more of a wise, not just a wise ass or a wise guy, but <laughs> actually a wizened executive who's bold, curious, and kind. So, so that's sagatica.com. Awesome. Well, uh, I really and enjoyed this conversation. I'm sure everyone listening to it as well. I, I hope your approach to corporations and leadership um, just takes off incredibly so and that uh that you're you're <laughs> you're not the rare and exotic creature that <laughs> your building was and that that becomes more common and and combining spirituality combining business i just think this is something that has been you know so lacking for for all of my time on the planet and yeah I, i'm just so psyched that you're out there doing this work and 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 sharing this book and and getting it to a wider and wider audience Right on. Thank you. And thank you for, for engaging and being an agent in that way and, and, and inviting me onto the show. I, 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 uh, I take your uh, sort of blessing and wish and, and totally double down on that. I do want, I really want to be in service to those who want to wake up and do the kind of, and have the kind of impact on their business and on society that, uh, that we deserve as humans. Right. So thank you. Thank you for the platform. Yeah. Beautiful. So uh, again, Eric, thanks for joining us. Everyone, thanks for listening. And I encourage you to look for ways to bring more kindness into how you engage and lead everyone around you and, and to look for that in the companies you do business with even, right? So until next time, thanks for joining us. And as always, be good to yourself. Thank you for listening to Real Men Feel. Contact us at realmenfeel at gmail.com Learn more about Andy Grant at theandygrant.com. Please subscribe to this podcast and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, TuneIn, or wherever you are discovering Real Men Feel.